This video was brought to you by Nebula. South Africa's political reputation is in tatters. Decades of corruption within the government and state-owned companies have created a whole host of systemic issues, which are proving very difficult to fix. The economy's limp, infrastructure is failing, and there's persistent poverty, unemployment, and violence. In this video, we'll take a look at what we're calling South Africa's everything crisis, split into four parts, politics, economics, infrastructure, and social issues. And as the country heads into an election in 2024, can things get any better? Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Firstly, let's look at South Africa's political crisis. After the end of white minority rule in 1994, the country became what's known as a one-party dominant state, led by the ANC, the African National Congress. The ANC, whose first president was Nelson Mandela, promised to reduce poverty and increased social mobility for black South Africans, as well as transform the economy through the Black Economic Empowerment Program. The ANC has won six successive elections and appointed five presidents, controlling politics at the national, regional and local levels. Apartheid has left South Africa with a lot of domestic problems as well as diplomatic isolation from the rest of the world. Initially, the ANC made impressive strides to address these problems, leading to relative political stability over the next decade. This meant that South Africa was able to emerge as a dominant power in Africa, and between 1995 and 2003, South African GDP grew an average of 3% per year, which was about double the rate of the previous 15 years. However, as South Africa's wealth and international status grew, so did factionalism within the ANC, and the ambitions of its political elite. The ANC was torn between those who espoused Nelson Mandela's approach to racial reconciliation, and a more populist faction represented by former President Jacob Zuma. From the mid-2000s under Zuma's influence, corruption, nepotism and fraud became rampant within government bodies. Zuma had served as South Africa's deputy president between 1999 and 2005, before becoming the ANC's presidential candidate in 2007. Zuma was then duly elected in 2009 and 2014, despite facing hundreds of criminal charges throughout this period. In June 2005, Zuma was charged with a mind-boggling 783 counts of money laundering and racketeering, after allegedly accepting bribes from a French arms company during the apartheid-era South African arms deal. Then, a few months later, he was charged with rape, before being acquitted the following year. Zuma's corruption charges were also dropped in 2006, before another corruption indictment was initiated and then dropped again in 2008. Zuma's trial continued to be postponed multiple times after this, due to spurious claims that the judges were biased. Eventually, he was jailed in 2021 for contempt of court after refusing to testify, spending just two months in prison before being released illegally. Zuma, who's now 81, was never sent back to jail though, supposedly because of overcrowding and a surge in gangsterism. By the time former business magnate Cyril Ramaphosa took over in 2018, South Africa's image problem had seemingly passed the point of no return. From 2009 to 2012 under Zuma, roughly half of South Africans were optimistic about the future of the country, but after 2012, negative opinions started dominating, and by 2017, two-thirds of the country believed it was moving in the wrong direction. Now, at least 80% of South Africans believe that some or all people in government departments, municipalities and the presidency are corrupt, according to the Afrobarometer poll. Now let's move on to South Africa's limp economy. When Ramaphosa came into office, people hoped he'd be able to kickstart the economy and restore ethical business practices, but sadly he hasn't had much success. The South African economy peaked in the mid-2000s, growing an average of 4.2% per year, but then, under Zuma's presidency, the country had its first post-apartheid era recession. Income growth went negative, job creation was weak, and the country went into enormous debt, leading to long-term socioeconomic issues like persistent unemployment and poverty, which Ramaphosa has struggled to fix. The unemployment rate has soared from 20% in 2003 to nearly 30% today, and poverty was an estimated 62.6% in 2022, with South Africa being one of the most unequal countries in the world. Public debt hit an all-time high of nearly 73% in June 2023, and GDP growth slowed to 1.9% in 2022 from 4.7% in 2021. Moreover, the socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic are still lingering, and there's a significant risk that the energy crisis will lead to a recession in the near future. 
To spur growth, the IMF has recommended that Ramaphosa's administration improve energy security, private investment, political leadership and job opportunities. But that's all easier said than done, especially when the current government has limited resources, high levels of public debt and infrastructure problems. South Africa's infrastructure system is literally falling apart. Toll roads are buckling under the increased weight of freight cargo as a lack of maintenance caused the freight rail system to break down, so that more than 70% of South Africa's industrial cargo now has to be transported by road. Transnet, the state-owned rail and port company, has been beset by chronic instability and incompetence, recording a loss of $306 million last year. And the company's container ports in Durban and Cape Town are among the 10 least efficient globally, according to the World Bank. The country's water and sewage systems are on the verge of collapse too. A recent report found that two-thirds of South Africa's wastewater treatment works are close to failure, and nearly half of them pose acute human health risks due to bacteria or other pathogens in the supply. Out of a total 958 water supply systems across South Africa, only 26 provide safe drinking water. This is also linked to problems with South Africa's electricity grid, as the facilities need reliable power to run effectively. But the electricity system itself is in a shocking state. In the first half of 2023, blackouts were even worse than in 2022, which was South Africa's worst ever year for power cuts. And electricity prices shot up 350% between 2008 and 2017. The state-owned provider ESCOM, which generates the vast majority of electricity in South Africa, has been plagued by mismanagement and cronyism. Back in 2011, Zuma's Minister of Public Enterprises, Malusi Gigaba, dismantled the long-standing ESCOM board, replacing all but two of its non-executive directors, and imposed a requirement that all of ESCOM's coal supply contracts be from mining companies with more than 50% black ownership. Then, ESCOM struck a contract with the Gupta family, a rich Indian business family with close ties to former President Zuma, to run its IT system. But the Guptas have been accused of using their personal friendship with Zuma to control the award of state contracts, in a process often known as state capture. A 2022 inquiry concluded that the Gupta family looted ESCOM and left it in billions of dollars of debt, leading to sanctions from multiple countries, and this also meant that a whole lot less money was available for upgrading the electricity grid. The Guptas have since fled South Africa and are currently thought to be in the UAE, avoiding extradition. So, what's the impact of this breakdown in state infrastructure? Well, on top of causing daily disruption for millions of South Africans, the state is now increasingly relying on expensive private sector contracts to either operate or deliver bulk infrastructure, exacerbating its debt issue. Ordinary South Africans are now having to set up their own electricity and water salination systems, which is why rooftop solar capacity has increased by an astonishing 350% since 2022. The legacy of mates' contracts, poor planning and corruption across various sectors has led to widespread system failure, and it'll take years, if not decades, to reset things to a point at which they can improve. Finally, we should address the social impact of all these interrelated crises. Violent crime in South Africa is on the rise, with the murder rate last year having hit its highest level in 20 years, at 45 per 100,000, a 50% increase compared to 10 years earlier. The province of KwaZulu-Natal has also fallen into the grip of political assassinations recently due to factionalist rivalries. A local ANC councillor was shot dead in the province last year, increasing the total number of murdered councillors in the past 12 months to 20, and more than 150 over the last decade. Gender-based violence in South Africa is also alarmingly high, and in the three months between April and June 2023, 855 women were killed and nearly 12,000 cases of violence against women were reported in total, including 9,500 cases of rape. Over half of South Africa's 60 million population live in poverty, and education has been ruined by crumbling school buildings and overcrowded classrooms. Poor governance and the state's failure to meet its education targets have led to social and behavioural problems in children, exacerbating vandalism, burglary, youth unemployment and crime. So what's in store for South Africa over the next few years? Well, it's a pivotal time for the country's democracy, as a national election is coming up in 2024. However, analysts expect turnout to be even lower than the meagre 49% who voted last time in 2019, and polling suggests the ANC will probably emerge as the largest party, largely because the main opposition party, the white-led Democratic Alliance, aren't that popular with most South Africans. This isn't entirely surprising once you realise that most South Africans have given up on democracy entirely. 70% of the population say they're dissatisfied with how the system works, and 72% admit they would prefer an unelected leader if they could deliver on jobs and crime.
While another ANC majority would obviously be catastrophic for South Africa, perhaps the worst outcome, or at least the most volatile, would be if the ANC were to win less than 50% and form a coalition with the Economic Freedom Fighters, or the EFF, who are currently polling in third place with about 10%. The EFF are a Marxist-Leninist black nationalist party founded by former ANC Youth League president Julius Malema. The EFF's policies include forcible repatriation of farmland from white South Africans, forced nationalisation of mines, banks and other, quote, strategic sectors of the economy, and sending arms to both Hamas and Russia to help Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Malema himself has garnered controversy for statements including, we are not calling for the slaughtering of white people, at least for now, and the majority of Indians are racist. The ANC and EFF formed regional coalitions in Johannesburg and Ekuhuleni last year, and the Democratic Alliance have now created a multi-party coalition with the other opposition parties in an attempt to prevent an ANC-EFF coalition at the national level, which DA leader John Steinhusen described as a doomsday coalition. Unfortunately for the DA, their new coalition is struggling in the polls, and an ANC-EFF coalition looks at least possible. You've no doubt been following along with the news from Israel and Gaza, but if you want a better understanding, to dive deeper into the history of the region, then you should check out Real Life Law's hour-long documentary about the tensions and fighting between Israel and Gaza going back decades. It's a superb way to brush up on the history of this region, giving colour and context to what's happening right now. That video, by the way, is part of Real Life Law's Modern Conflict series, where they regularly run through major ongoing conflicts, from Lebanon's civil war to everything going on in Myanmar and the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. It's an incredible series, and it's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. As you likely know, Nebula is the streaming service that we built with a bunch of our creator friends, and is home to tons of smart educational content. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like Modern Conflicts, China Actually from Polymatter, or the logistics of X from Wendover Productions, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because you signing up contributes to the budgets of these big documentaries and helps us to grow and expand our ambitions. So if you want to sign up, use the link below because that not only supports us directly, but it also gets you a Nebula annual plan for 40% off. That's less than two pounds a month, which is an incredibly good price for an independent streaming service, which not only supports creators, but also provides you with tons of ad-free exclusive content. Anyway, thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.